Wednesday, August 21st. German planes carried out new raids against England today, attacking the Midlands and southeastern sections. Until the new raids, England had experienced a decided lull in German air activity. In Berlin, radio stations went off the air. No reason was given for the action, but this usually happens when British planes are in the neighborhood. German newspapers said poor weather had slowed down their campaign against England. That's the news reported by the press associations. Now Columbia's correspondents report direct from abroad, London and Berlin. First, the report of Edward R. Murrow from the British capital. Go ahead, London. This is London. Londoners slept well last night. There were no air raid warnings, and the Ministry of Home Security reports a rather quiet night over all of Britain. A German air activity is described as negligible. The Germans made dive bombing attacks on a southwest town where some people were killed and many injured. Some fatal casualties were also caused in Essex and a South Wales town. Bombs fell near a railway station in southwest England where a number of people were killed. Several bombs were dropped in the Midlands this morning. There is no information as to casualties, but the bombs dropped in a thickly populated district. It is believed the German aircraft made widespread attacks in southeastern England this morning. There is considerable speculation this morning concerning the crash of the German mystery plane in County Kerry, only about 50 miles from Foynes, the home base of the British flying boat Clare. The Irish have been questioning the surviving German crew members most of the night. Three unofficial explanations are advanced for the presence of the German plane. The first is that the bomber was on reconnaissance, charting information for the possible invasion of error. The second, that the Germans' navigation instruments had failed and the aircraft was lost. And the third, that the German bomber was hoping to give a dramatic demonstration of Germany's total blockade by shooting down the big British transatlantic flying boat as it neared its home base. In the opinion of most air experts, the Clare would have been a sitting duck had the big, fast German bomber been able to make contact. Newspaper headlines this morning say that Mr. Churchill's speech in the House of Commons yesterday rang the bell in America. London editors emphasize his statement that Britain now leads Germany in warplane production the refusal to permit food to pass through the blockade to German-occupied territory, and the announcement that bases in Newfoundland and the West Indies will be leased to the United States. The Daily Herald feels that Mr. Churchill should have been a little more specific on the matter of war aims. It is now generally agreed that German shells from long-range guns have fallen on the southeast coast. Apparently, they were few in number and caused little damage. We are told that it would be possible for those German guns across the Channel to lob shells into London but no one seems particularly worried at the prospect. The experts say fire at such range would be inaccurate, and the guns wouldn't stand up for very long under the heavy charges that would be necessary to propel a shell such a long distance. It is believed that the Germans will use those guns to bombard shipping in the channel, and perhaps to throw shells into places like Dover and Folkestone. According to the Daily Herald, people in widely scattered parts of Britain are demanding a more satisfactory system of air raid warnings. Several times, the first warning of danger has been the explosion of bombs. The sirens have sounded some minutes later. At Croydon last Thursday, the first warning came 15 minutes after the first bombs fell. Sir John Anderson, in explaining this state of affairs yesterday, said that it had appeared that the threatened attack on London would not materialize. But later, part of a German formation broke away, changed direction suddenly, and launched their attack against Croydon. Fighter Command is responsible for giving the order to sound the sirens and it is faced with a difficult problem. Fast bombers can change direction and be over their targets in very little time. On the other hand, if the air raid warnings are sounded over a wide area, the stoppage of factories engaged in war work involves a serious loss of production. London parents are bringing their children home. They're returning at the rate of over 2,000 a week. German bombs dropped in areas to which the children have been evacuated seem to have convinced parents that their children would be safer back in London under the protection of the balloon barrage. Down in Surrey, men of the Home Guard found a platform in a tree. They thought maybe a German spy was using it for signaling to German aircraft. An armed guard was mounted, and the men of the Home Guard waited for developments. Nothing happened. Then it was discovered that the platform had been erected by the British Broadcasting Corporation for the purpose of broadcasting the Song of the Nightingale. I return you now to CBS in New York. That was Edward R. Murrow reporting from London. Here is a dispatch from Rome. An intensification of the war against British colonies was predicted today following Italy's warning to neutral countries that ships approaching within 30 miles of the coasts of the Mediterranean, Red Sea, Gulf of Aden, Egypt, and British African colonies 
were in danger of destruction by mines or other means of war. We take you now to the German capital for the report of Edwin Hartridge. This is Berlin. Mr. Mr. Churchill's statement to the House of Commons yesterday comes in for its expected criticism in this part of the world. The Berlin papers agree that Winston Churchill did not say very much, and what he did have to say did not explain away the military difficulties which are facing Great Britain today. The Borsen Zeitung sums up the reactions here with this comment. Quote, if it is an art to change black into white, the defeats into victories, then Winston Churchill's statement of yesterday may be considered a masterpiece. His announcement that the British government is to lease naval and air bases in the Western Hemisphere is labeled by the same paper as the sale of an empire. And the local Anzago makes this comment about the leasing of these bases. Quote, it is evident to the whole world that England has taken this step because she does not see any other way out of her present distress. End of quote. Then as regards the English Prime Minister's prophecy that the war will go on, possibly lasting for two or three more years, this paper comments... Quote, it is not Churchill who will determine the duration of this war, but German weapons, end of quote. Also, the British withdrawal from Somaliland is a source of great editorial jubilation here. The ready comparison has been made with previous British withdrawals from Andalusnais and Namsos in Norway, Dunkirk, and now Somaliland. The German editors have ironically identified the last operation as, quote, another British victory, end quote. As for military news, there seems to be little this morning. The day and day reports that flying weather is bad along the Channel Coast and aerial activity is limited to reconnaissance flights. So it looks like another quiet day. At 6 p.m. last night, the German government handed the American Embassy here a note further explaining the German stand regarding the question of the safe conduct of the United States Army transport to the American Legion. The Foreign Office explained this morning that due to erroneous reports, it was thought necessary to further clarify this matter. And in this note, the Foreign Office pointed out to you that the American ships were always safe in their encounters with German naval vessels, but that the change of the course of the American Legion had caused some worry here in government circles. But the idea that the American Legion had changed its course because of a food shortage, food shortage on board was considered amusing here, the Foreign Office spokesman said, because the new course was considerably longer. And questioned about the reaction of the Joint Defense Council to be set up by the United States and Canada, the spokesman said that comment would be reserved regarding that matter. There are two interesting items from low countries this morning. One is the report in the Deutsche Zeitung for Netherlands that the crew of a British plane which landed in Holland on Saturday has thus far exceeded in escaping the German military authorities. And the population is warned to be on the lookout for the British. This paper reports that the plane carried 12 men who left their uniforms behind. These 12 Englishmen may have landed in Holland to do some sabotage work, the paper adds. Then there's a decree by the German military authorities published in the Brussels Zeitung that all gold, gold coins and allies containing gold in northern France and Belgium must be reported to the authorities. This gold must be offered either to the Mission Bank in Brussels or to the Reich's credit Casa in Luxembourg, according to this decree. In preparation for what may be a hard winter, we learned that the city of Budapest has obtained a 25 million pango credit with which to set up a fund reserve. This fund, approximately $5 million, will be used to purchase potatoes, flour, fats, and eggs should there be a food shortage this winter. This is Edwin Hartridge, a returning now to Columbia in New York. And here in New York is Elmer Davis to give you his analysis of the day's news. Mr. Davis. In spite of this further exchange of notes with regard to the Transport American Legion, which is bringing back 900 refugees, mostly Americans, from Northern Europe, it looks as if everything will end smoothly in that case because Washington officials believe this morning that the transport has got safely through the mined zone. The State Department said it had no word from the American Legion and the War and Navy Departments had nothing to say which is somewhat different. It's believed in Washington they may be in communication. But at any rate, it was said day before yesterday afternoon at the German embassy that the ship would be in danger for 12 hours, and since it's now something like 38 hours, it looks as if she ought to be out of the danger zone. And since this is probably the case, 
It might be remarked that some people seem to have been looking at this thing from the wrong slant. Senator Bone yesterday uh, made a speech in the Senate and said that the United States might be plunged into war by the stubbornness of whoever told the American Legion not to change its course, but to go through an area which the Germans said was mined. Now, there's certainly no likelihood that uh, the United States could have been plunged into war by any misadventure happening to the American Legion, because there was obviously not the slightest reason for the Germans to make any attack on her, and if anything had befallen her, it would have been pretty clear that it could have been only from a mine, and as the Germans said, they cannot control a mine. But now that she's safe, it may be speculated that the real issue was something else. I advance a theory suggested to me by one of my colleagues, which seems pretty sound. The British minefields, which they announced they had laid three or four weeks ago, extend through the waters around Greenland and uh, between Greenland and Iceland, according to their story, and also south of Iceland to the small Isle of Rona to the northwest of Scotland. Now, just how many mines the British have laid in this area is, of course, open to question. Uh, various powers have announced it earlier times in the war that they have mined extensive areas of the ocean and occasionally they wouldn't have had time to do anything but scatter a few mines here and there. That was notably the case with regard to the British announcement that they had mined a large area in the Baltic last April during the war in Scandinavia. And just how many mines the British have actually planted up in those waters is open to some doubt, but nevertheless they said they did it three weeks ago and they also have those waters to some extent under patrol. That left the comparatively narrow passage, a matter of uh, 100 miles or so perhaps, but uh, at least a small area of the ocean between the island of Rona and the northern part of Scotland. And the Germans last weekend announcing their total blockade of the British Isles said they had laid minefields around there, and it is believed that uh, they, the story was that they had laid mines in that area out of plains. Now, to what extent you can successfully mine an area with planes is also open to some doubt, obviously depending on how many planes you use and the extent of the ocean which you try to cover with your mines. But at any rate, the United States government, by insisting that the American Legion should take this course between Rona and the north of Scotland, that is to say through the German minefield rather than through the British minefield, indicated that they took the British minefield more seriously than that of the Germans. That is, they thought the British had probably laid more mines than the Germans and that the area that the British had announced as unsafe was really more unsafe than that which the Germans had so declared. And it was perhaps this feeling that the United States was not taking the German minefield seriously and that if the American Legion passed through without injury, it would indicate that the German minefield was not to be taken so seriously. This may have been the real emotional issue which was at stake. Of course, it wouldn't prove anything if a single ship did get through an area which was said to have been mined. You can't cover a hundred miles of sea completely. But at any rate, it's quite possible that that was the whole difficulty, that uh, the United States government didn't believe the German minefield should be taken so seriously as that of the British. Well, there seems to be comparatively little action this morning, and again, the Germans blame the bad weather. Although when they speak of armed reconnaissance, if the weather is very bad, you wouldn't think they could do very much reconnoitering. The report from London that it's been positively identified that German shells have fallen on the British coast doesn't seem to worry them. It is admitted, however, that these guns uh, planted uh, near Calais or thereabouts could possibly hit London. They couldn't aim at anything in particular in London, but London is a big target which they could hardly miss. But as the shelling of Paris proved in the last war, that sort of random bombardment doesn't do much damage. And with the news thus analyzed from New York by Alma Davis, Columbia concludes this morning report of European developments. Edward R. Murrow reported from London. Edward Hartridge was heard reporting from Berlin. Larry Elliott speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.